just bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you this morning for a privilege to be in your presence. I pray that as we get into your word, Lord, we pray for revelation knowledge to reach your people, that you open the eyes of your people, that they may grasp and comprehend your will. We pray that they may be changed in the lives of your people. And Lord, we pray for those with heavy weights, lightweight issues, that let your word bring forth a way out in this meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take your seats in God's presence. We want to start by acknowledging those of you who are visiting us for the first time. This is Hillview Church. Thanks for visiting. Let's give the teams a big hand as they go out. Uh, yeah, we had a very powerful next gen service yesterday at 3 p.m. to 4.30. If you have teens in your house, please bring them on. Let them come and learn and grow with others. We have started a session called 4 plus 2. Decision Matrix, a very powerful instrument. Uh, we are dealing with uh, four, what is that? Four retrogressive decisions that teens can make and two progressive decisions that every teen and young adult should make. I told you in this church we make people better because Jesus came to the world to make us better. Don't close your teen in your house until she learns how to open the window and go out. Sacrifice your time of leisure to bring her here in God's house. Wait for her, go and grab coffee and come back. If you are raising a teen in your house, here's what it means. You have five years left for her or him to leave your house. Please do your best and God bless you. Yeah, we want to welcome those of you who are here for the first time. As the service ends, you can go into the visitor's lounge so that we can just get to see you and love you as the leaders of the church. And in case you, you need prayer after the service, I'll go into the mother's room immediately. We finish here. Just come through so that maybe we can just stand with you and pray with you. We are excited to be launching in the near future on the 24th. Remember that we are dealing with a theme, knowing Jesus and making him known. When I say 2024, you say knowing Jesus and making him known. 2024? Knowing Jesus and making him known. Ah, you are too low for me. 2024? Ah, I think the site is much more better. Let me hear you louder. 2024. Jesus and I know you're going to do better than them. 2024. Jesus and 2024. Jesus and so this place, this pulpit, this auditorium is going to be a classroom for learning about Jesus. But lessons that have been done without practicals are never an effective way of learning. So we have created a classroom, I mean an, an experiential ground for you to learn in the classroom and then to go and experiment outside. So on the, 20, on the 24th of February, we are going to be having a first outreach to phase four area, just here. And we have made it to be a family package would be in three areas at the same time. One area men, one area women, one area next gen. So there's going to be a competition to see who are the most effective in church and in reaching out to people. There's going to be a competition to also say who will turn up much more for their activity. And please, Hillview Church, it's a male... Yeah. So, so how, do, how do we campaign uh, uh, for men? Yeah, so, but there's going to be three important areas. We want to make it fun so each team would have its own stall, its jumping castle to go and reach out and we want you to come uh, and then you'd be separated because it's the same area. We're going to be rocking up some activation model of going around the area. It's going to be nice and it's going to be a place for you to learn to share the love of God. So please reserve the date. We are likely to make it twice. We are about to finalize that decision this week. So we are still observing the area to find the times that have more traffic, but we might do it 
morning, like 9 to 11, and then another group comes in the afternoon, say 5 to 7 or 4 to, 4 to 6, somewhere there. So we ask him for, at least we may have the teams exchanging. So there's the first team and then the second team. So next week would give you an opportunity to register with your team. Each team would have to register. There are people who would come in the morning and there are people who would come in the afternoon. Let's see who would win more people to the Lord. And the church said? Yes. yes. So let's go back to our subject, knowing Jesus. So here we are knowing Jesus. As we go out, we are making Jesus what? No. So we want to start from the basics and let's remember the terms of reference for this study. This is a course. So here's the terms of reference for studying Jesus, for knowing Jesus. In the Greek, there are three important words that I've opted for because I think there are around seven or whatever words that you can use to, to mean to know. In Sotswana, to know means with, and that's all. In English, to know means to know. But in the Greek and in the Hebrew, there are different ways that can be used to display an accurate understanding of a phenomenon. So there are different ways that represent different interaction or different levels of knowing a thing. The first word that we started here with was the word, can you say it? This side, what was the first word? Logos. So we said logos means knowing a phenomenon based on reason. It's a knowledge, it's a set of knowledge that is produced by reasoning. You can reason it out. That's logos. So you can know Jesus at a logos level, which means it's only at a logical level and at a reasonable level. And I can tell you there are dimensions of Jesus that cannot be put within a microscope and be reasoned out. So you'd miss on him if you only know him at a logos level. Second level is the Edo level. I've told you Edo refers to intuitive knowledge or knowledge that is derived by intuition. This is a type of knowledge that you get by feeling. It's more abstract. It's, it's not necessarily concrete, but it's knowledge that can move you. Yeah. So there are certain things that you can know by intuition. And you can know Jesus by intuition, just falling in love with the name Jesus, just falling in love with what Jesus does, like he's a guy of the church, like he feeds the blind. So you can know him at that level. And then we talked about the third level, which is uh, 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 the most intense level uh, uh, in the Greek. It's called Gnosko. At a Gnosko level, we are talking about experiential knowledge. You can know Christ by experience, just like you can know things by experience. And Gnosko is so, the scope of knowing at an experiential level, it's huge because it means experience and also experimenting so that you come to the understanding of the content or the factual information about the phenomenon. And I've said to you, most of the time when, when Paul says, I want to know Christ, he doesn't use Edo, no Logos, he uses Ginosko. So as we are all here, I think all of you have heard the name Jesus. But we are in different dimensions of learning about him. My intention this morning and in the next sessions is to, give you into the, to lead you into the fourth level of knowing Christ, which is knowing Christ by revelation. Knowing Christ by revelation, it's, this is why we fail to define it with one word. But it's like an opening into a sphere. So revelation is an opening into a sphere. Can you imagine if I would open this place and then you suddenly see what is on the other side. So revelation is the ability to access or to have insight into the next dimension. So there are various dimensions of who Jesus is that you can get into through revelation. And when we have that revelation, it changes you. And here's why we are teaching about knowing Jesus. is because in the understanding of the scripture, knowledge about God should transform you. The scripture says, my people are perishing because of lack of knowledge. And I've said in the morning that the, 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 the Hebrew word for knowing is the Hebrew is the word yada, which would be uh, 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 my name in Setswana, if you know my name. Uh, uh, and that also represents a combination of ginosko 
and intimacy. So that's very important to know because I'm showing this dimension because how far you can receive from God is dependent on how far you know him. If you only know him at a reasonable level, you receive what is reasonable. And you only apply the concepts of faith only on issues you feel it's reasonable. If you know him by revelation, you might be facing a circumstance that facts are saying it cannot be done, but revelation knowledge says Jesus can deal with this. So you give it to him. But somebody who is limited to knowing Jesus at an ego level cannot elevate an issue to a revelation level. So we all need to grow at whatever level that you are. Maybe you're at an entry level. Maybe you have just been saved. Maybe you don't know Jesus this morning. This is a good service for you because you can come into contact with him. But I'm going to be sitting at the far right of knowing him, which is knowing him by gnosko, knowing him by revelation. Because such knowledge, it's functional. They say a branch of philosophy called epistemology. Epistemology deals with how people learn or forms of knowledge. It deals with various theoretical framework of knowledge. One of the major arms, one of the major theories in that reasoning is that knowledge, knowledge is only effective when it can change people, when it can change how you make decisions, when it can change your behavior, when it can correct things that are wrong, and when it can add value. I'm going to repeat that again. Because majority of you think knowledge is power, but not every knowledge is power. You can have a knowledge at a logos level that is useless. You can have knowledge that at an ego level that is useless. Knowledge is only power if it can do what? Number one, change your behavior. Number two, influence how you make decisions. Number three, add value. Number four, change how? Add value? I don't know. Yeah, something. I've said them, but there are four. If you have missed them, you'd ask from your friend. So, so that's how functional knowledge should change you. Functional knowledge should add value into your life. Functional knowledge should change how you do things, change how you make your decisions, and correct certain things that are wrong to make them right. You see, the difference between you and a doctor is that all, most of you here, if I can ask you, do you know a kidney? You'd say yes. Yeah. But what you know is you know the word kidney and you know information about kidney. That's how far you, you go. And maybe what is said to be its function. But its knowledge cannot become functional for you because... You, are not, you don't know how it forms, how it functions, what irritates it, how to make it. All that information, somebody who knows it much more better can apply that knowledge now and help you and add value from the information that he knows. I, I don't know whether that helps. People who are operating in the psychological area, for example, all of us would know about the brain because we have the brain. But our information and interaction in terms of usability called utilitarianism is based on how far can we exploit what we know. So if what you know is at a what level and it never at a how level, it can never become so much beneficial for you. You would benefit at a what level. Those who know how level, they would benefit at a how level. What am I saying? I'm trying to move all of us in our relationship with Jesus to not only have Jesus as Lord, but to have Jesus as our everything. And he can only become our everything if we know he is everything. If your Jesus cannot heal, you would be sick and you would... If your Jesus cannot provide for you, you would need certain things and you would never receive from him because your limited understanding limits how far he can go and how far he can do for you. So we all want to move into a functional knowledge so that your knowledge of God and your relationship with Jesus becomes beneficial for you. Most people have fallen in love with church, but they've never fallen in love with Christ. And it is knowing Jesus that changes you, changes your circumstances, and changes how you view life. That's what the knowledge of Jesus should do. So I want to take time 
to deal with this subject without running. And this time I want to start today in John chapter number 3, verse number 3. Now, John chapter number 3, verse number 3. And I'm happy majority of you are writing, this is going to be a classroom of faith. It's going to be a classroom of Jesus. So here's the first question that we are dealing with. How do we enter the kingdom of God? A good teacher should be able to ask the same question more than three times. So I'm going to try. How do we enter the kingdom of God? Same question. How do we get saved? How do we get saved? How do we enter the kingdom of God? I think I'm stuck at two. Now, in John chapter number three, verse number three, Jesus is answering a question to a guy you know called Nicodemus. He says, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And if I read it in my version, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see the kingdom of God or get saved through a concept we call acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ. How do I get saved? How do I enter the kingdom of God? By acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, I know what you are looking at. This. So the scripture says, by being born again. So how do you get born again? By acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I hope you are following. How do we enter the kingdom of God? By being born again. How do we get born again? By acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And remember, this is key for majority of us who have been in the church for the longest time. Remember, Jesus is introducing a kingdom. He's saying, how do you join his kingdom? Because, you know, until we flip away from religion to kingdom thinking, we are going to struggle with a lot of kingdom concepts. Because Jesus did not come to introduce a religion. He came in to set up a kingdom. He always said the kingdom of God is near. He always said the kingdom of God is what he came to promote. That's why the scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these things shall be added to you. So remember once again in this classroom, the concept is kingdom. Now, how do you join a kingdom? You join a kingdom by acknowledging the lordship of the king. So we started there. Romans chapter number 10, verse number, number, number 9. I want us to go back there so that we are building this slowly and so forth. So one more time, here is the logical flow. How do you enter the kingdom of God? By being born again. How do you get born again? By declaring, acknowledging the lordship of Jesus. Now I want us to go to a text that shows how you acknowledge the lordship of Jesus. Here it is. If you confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. Can I hear all of you say Jesus is Lord? Jesus. So when you say Jesus is Lord, here's what you are doing. You are acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus. You are saying there is a kingdom that Jesus lords over. When you say that and then you believe in your heart. So the first expression is audible and it's external. The second other content of getting into the kingdom of God, it's internal. It's, it's at a belief level. When you believe that, so when there is a correlation between what is believed and what is being said, here's what the scripture says, you will be saved when you speak and when you believe. And these are very important instruments. This is why I'm going back to this text because I can tell you everything in the kingdom of God, look at me, Everything in the kingdom of God is dependent on what the mouth does and what the heart does. Everything in the kingdom is dependent on what the mouth does. There is nothing that you will receive in the kingdom unless you speak. And some of us, we have been going to church, but our mouth are still speaking like we are in the world. We can't receive the things of the kingdom when our mouth is not aligned to kingdom language. Everything that functions by faith requires speaking. I've taught you when we were talking about during the prayer and fasting here, how 
Abraham says, the God who calls things that are not as if they are. And how Paul, the apostle in, in 1 Corinthians, he talks about, I have believed and therefore I do what? I speak. The kingdom of God requires speaking. There are things you would never receive unless you speak. Now the problem is science have taught you that speaking is vibration and communication too. So you think you are sending a message and you are speaking. Speaking is a controlling dimension in the spirit. It's a controlling factor. That's why speaking controls whether you enter into the kingdom. And it, Look at whatever Jesus did. How did he do it? By speaking. So how you speak as a believer affects how far you go. Some of you, your language is still nasty, dirty, full of unbelief. The only time you speak Jesus is when you say he is Lord. So you can only receive at that level. The next thing is believing. The heart plays a big role in this kingdom. And whatever you can do and whatever, the dimension of receiving and activating miracles and breakthrough is dependent at the display of your heart at a believing level. So in our encounter to Jesus, with Jesus, two things are important. What we say and what we believe. In our progression with Jesus, two things are important. How we speak and how we believe. But majority of us, our language is wordly stuff. How we speak when we are attacked by circumstances. This depression is killing me. This anxiety is, you know, they are part of my life. You know, I don't think I would ever be promoted. You are speaking your language. There is a language for the kingdom. One of the things every kingdom will do when it comes into a particular place is to introduce their language and nationalize it. This is what the Europeans have done so well. Look at me and hear how I sound articulating their language as if it's mine. It's because I have been colonized by a kingdom and I do so well when I'm able to speak their language better. If the kingdom of heaven has to colonize you, it means it has to change your thinking to the extent that you see your way of reasoning as inferior to their language. Do you understand? So, when Jesus comes into contact with you, for, him to, for you to have knowledge of him at a gnosko level, which starts the process of change, your language has to change, your heart condition has to change in terms of believing. When that happens, the next important statement is important. Every encounter with the Lordship of Jesus brings about two things. At a technical level, we call them Transformation and translation. I'm going to explain that. Every encounter with Christ at a born again level, at a salvation level, at a kingdom level, when you give your life to Christ, what happens? That's the question that I'm asking. That I'm answering. What happens when a sinner instantly declares Jesus? The Lordship of Jesus initiates certain processes. The first process is transformation, and the second one is translation. And this translation is at a secondary level, which means change of location. So when you give your life to Jesus, Jesus initiates transformation in you. You become different. And secondly, he takes you into a new location spiritually where you begin to exist. That's why the book of Colossians says he has translated us from the kingdom of what? Darkness into the kingdom of his light. So there is transformation. And this process, I'm describing them sequentially, but they are happening simultaneously. There's transformation and translation. Now let's go to our cortex. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 17. That's where we want to sit. And I know, uh, yeah, my introduction is always longer than the message. That's fine. That's fine. So it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, all things have passed away, behold, all things are, are become, that's very interesting, are become new. I don't know what that one says. Behold, the new has come, okay? 
Yeah, the new has come. That's still fine. But I like how, because the, the, the King James Version wants to represent the progressive and instant nature of how things happen. All things have become new. So it sounds like broken English. It is because of the context of the limitation of, of English to describe the Greek process. Let's go back to the text. Now, first of all, let's look at the statement. Who can be in Christ? Anyone. So that's the, that's the first good news. The first good news is remember that being in Christ at this level represent knowing him. So let me ask it at a lower level of where we are. Who can know Christ? Who can know Christ? According to this text. Anyone. And that's the good news. If you are here, it's your first time to be here. Or if you are here and you are struggling at a Logos level, you can't pray, you don't know whether prayer works, you are struggling, you are coming to church, but you don't know whether this thing is the real thing. Here's the good news. You can become, you can come to a level of knowing Christ. Now let's look at that preposition because it's key. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Now that preposition dis describes a place which means in our understanding of faith we need to know that there is a realm in the spirit where people can stay, walk, eat, do things, cause motion, drive out demons, do miracles and that place is called what? In Christ. I'm going to be showing you in the dimensions because one of the major dimensions of understanding and working with Christ, doing miracles, living a life that is above the normal life of an average citizen is knowing the intercourse of being in him and him being in you. Christ in us and we in Christ. And I want to take all of us. This is not a place that I have, that I uh, I am at is a place that I want to be. I want to be what the scripture says. I want to believe what the scripture says. And I want to live my life the way the scripture says I should be. I want to recognize and esteem my being in Christ rather than my being in Botswana, my being in Hillview, my being in any platform. I want my being in Christ to influence how I make decisions and how I push for my dreams and how I believe for my future. To be based solely, not on my profession, not on my attainments, not on where I come from, but on being in Christ. Why? Being in Christ is a platform of change. Once you get into Christ, here's what the scripture says, once you touch base with that platform, you become a new creation. A new creation. And look at what the scripture says. When you become this brand new person, the next thing is that all your past get taken away and all your, your future is recreated. So at salvation, when you say, when you acknowledge the lordship of Jesus, Here's what happens. You get translated into Christ. Once you rest on Christ, Christ transforms you. Your old dead sinner gets eliminated and a brand new person in you gets saved. I think we need to answer that question with clarity. Who is the new creation in Christ? It is what Jesus talks about in John 3, verse 3. It is the spirit man of a born again believer. The new creation is a person who is born again. Now that person is different from your old self. And I think that's where church gets it wrong. That when you give your life to Jesus, you leave this door having the same physical body but having a brand new person inside of you. Here is the key. Let's kill the old person whom all his things have gone and let's nurture the new born creation inside of us. 
This is why Paul the Apostle says, I am crucified with who? With Christ. I no longer live. The old is gone. Some of us, we came to Christ. But we have not yet crucified the old man. So he creates a lot of trouble. There's a theme in the Bible that talks about the old and the new. It cuts across from Genesis up to, up to uh, 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 Revelation of how the old would always interfere with the new. You know how when you try to get the new one, when you have the old one. Suddenly the old one was because it doesn't work. You can't get the new while keeping the old. I'm not saying anything. Yeah, but I, but I know when, when things are made at that level, you will interact with them. So, Genesis, God says to Abraham, leave the old where you are because I want to give you the new. Israel, this whole story of Israel is about God separating people from their old mindsets into a new mindset. And a scripture that I can read for you, Isaiah chapter number 43, Isaiah chapter number 43, and it is in verse number 18. It is in verse number, number 18 and verse number, it's 43, 18. It says, forget what? The former things. Forget them. Forget the former things. Why? Because God is saying, I'm about to do a new thing. So every time, this is why Jesus said the same thing. He said, do not put the new wine on what? On the old skin. It's a progressive theme in scripture. New and old cannot meet. When you combine them, you're creating a problem. So the new born again believer, the new born again person in you, who you are now is that new born again spirit man. Now you should make sure that that new born again spirit man inside you does not get killed by old things. In the Old Testament, and this is what I, and this might sound too deep for you, because in the Old Testament, they had no capacity to have their past eliminated from them. Because the Old, the Old Testament saints could not get saved. That's too technical. They couldn't have Jesus inside of them. So they could not become new creation. This is why Jesus had to come and die. So that those who believe in him, he can then make them what? New creation. And here's the good news. If you read this text with the understanding, you can love Jesus so much. Because Jesus recognized, you're going to have to deal with your past. And he said, no, if I leave them to deal with their past, the past are too difficult. Because I told the other guys to forget the past. They couldn't forget the past. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe off their past. I make them new and then I take away the old. Past perfect tense. Put your hand on your chest and say, I'm a new creation. Say, I don't have history. So the new born again believer in you does not have history. It has been eliminated. Your sins have been taken away at the cross. They get dictated to the events of the cross. I'm going to be teaching you on, on imputation, how Christ has, be, has imputed his righteousness on him. And the Greek word used in that particular is, is an accounting word. That means that you debit the expenses that are coming from that account and also you carry over into the, into the kingdom. So when Jesus died for you, he provided a platform for starting fresh. All things passed away. You know why God does not want you to deal with the past? It's because it's human tendency to want to correct and edit the past. It's also human tendency to always want to make the past look better. Yes. Yeah. If I can have dialogue with you outside, you'd soon say, I remember the old good days when we were as if they were good. But we know the past is never better than the present. Most of the time. Because life is progressive. Development are progressive. But those of us who have been in the church think that we have, we, our church was the real thing back then. 
is deception. So Jesus says, I need to eliminate the past. And then after eliminating the past, here's the good news. He gives you a brand new life. He says, behold, all things are new. Because the past have a tendency of making people not to see things that are new. The Old Testament version of Isaiah chapter number 43 verse number 19 says, Can you not perceive it? I am doing something new. It talks about perception, the mental ability to see concrete things around you. Because when you concentrate in your past, you can't see what God is doing in front of you. So God is at work. When you get to know that your past has been taken away and you have a brand new life in front of you, guess what you'll do? You move forward. This text is not a promise. It says, therefore, when you are in Christ, is a statement of fact. If you are in Christ, your past is not going to be taken away. As a young man, as a young girl, I don't care what you have done in your past. I don't care how people have labeled you. You can start afresh in Christ. You may not be starting afresh at your home. You may not be starting afresh in your profession. But Christ can give you an opportunity to start fresh. And that fresh is your choice. Whether you are going to believe your friends that are going to be telling you about the mistakes at junior schools or the mistakes at university or you are going to take advantage and say, I'm holding on to how God perceives me and describes me other than how my friends and family describes me. And then the scripture gives us a, trans, a, a, a translation of what happens. It is in John chapter number 1 verse number 12. I want to read that because that is important to cement the idea that you are a brand new person. And this brand new person it is in the Lord. Now in John chapter number 1 the scripture verse says verse number 12. But as many as received him. Now look at me. Look at the change of the text. You have received him. We are talking about you in Corinthians as being in him. So if you receive him, it means he gets into you. You understand? So there's an exchange. You are in Christ and he also gets into you. So when you receive him, which is a process that takes place, that's why we talk about receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. When you receive him, here's what he does. He gives you the power the Greek word there is dunamis, which means an intrinsic power or potential energy in a dynamite. Can I explain that again? The word there is dunamis. Dunamis means an intrinsic potential energy in a dynamite. A dynamite is what you take, throw it into the ground, it explodes there. When it explodes, it breaks everything around it so that the gold or the treasure, whatever is inside, can come out. When you encounter Jesus, what he does is to put power inside of you so that whatever may be around you to resist your ability to come out and shine, you, through the power in you, you may blast everything and come out and shine. This is why the new born again believer in you is a powerful person. He has the nature of God. He cannot fail. He cannot be rejected. The new born again creation of God in us has the sperm of Christ. I'm simplifying it so that you don't take me for granted and I say, this, I say the sperm. But here's what we mean. Every sperm has the DNA of a person who is providing it. And I can show you in this text. Okay, I can elaborate it. I don't care. I can elaborate it. Look at what it says. Verse, Verse number 12, but as many as received him to them, he gave them what power to be called what sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse number 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Put your hand on your chest and say, I belong to God. So I'm born of God. So I have the DNA of God. So he's very clear. He wants you to see it. You are not born out of the flesh. You are not born because you're, this born again creation does not come in because your father wanted you or your mother wanted you or somebody was lonely or whatever. No, it is because of God's creation. He says, not of the will of the blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of men, but of God. What does that mean? You have the DNA, the life of God, the nature of God in you. 
and I can prove it further. First John, first John, so that I can close with this. First John chapter number four, verse number four. King James Version, this is why we like it. It says, ye are of God. Yeah. Some messages are nice when you, you preach them in, in the King James Version. Ye are of God. It's like, thou shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Because if you just say you, but, but here's, here's what we are interested in. This is a second person imperative. It has you. So John says, if you read this text in the Greek, it's very simple. It says, you are product of God, little children. You come from God. In other words, your first place of existence was in God. So you carry the DNA of where you are coming from, which is where? In God. And therefore, you have overcome. You have already overcome because you carry in you a DNA that cannot be overcome by sickness, by stress, by anxieties, by depression. There's the DNA of God in you that can overcome any circumstance when you are facing uh, uh, injustices. This DNA of God can win any systems in the world. It is in you. So John says, greater is he who is in you. You come from this DNA and you have somebody who is inside of you. Who is that? It is Christ inside of you. And therefore, nothing can ever defeat you. So the new born again believer, it's a powerful being. And I know a majority of us here, we know church, but we don't know the sweet. And we don't know the reality of who we are. If there is anything that the devil has done so much well for you, is to make sure that you don't know who you are. Because when you fight battles knowing that I have already won, I am already a new creation. This is why in the olden days, in the olden days, in the olden days, we used to sing the songs, I'm a new creation, I'm born again, all things have passed away. And because that's who we are. That's who you are. How do you win? How do you fight? And let me just, as I close this message, go into a practical application. How do you fight unemployment? How do you fight injustice at workplace? How do you fight depression? How do you fight your anxieties? How do you fight being broke? How do you fight this? It is by recognizing who you are. And recognizing that I am a son. I have been given the power to be called the son of God. I have the DNA. And the scripture says, I have already overcome. Not I will overcome. So I'm going to choose to stand with God's way rather than to stand with science, rather than to stand with positivism, rather than to stand with motivation because it produces no results. But I'm going to hang on on the cross and say whatever God says I am, that I believe I am. And whatever God's word says I am, that is what I'm speaking. You choose to define yourself based God on God's word. I am victorious. I am not trying to become victorious. I am victorious. Because according to God's word, God does not give birth to victims. This new creation here is a victor by nature from birth. So I'm choosing not to become a victim. You know, faith is the ability to acknowledge facts but rise up to the reality over them. Yes, I'm broke, but I'm believing God for provision. Yes, I can see that my children are going forward, but I'm calling them into direction. Calling them because in faith we speak. You call them to order. Yes, I can see that I, there's a lot of unemployment here, but I declare I'm getting employed in the best organization and I'm paid salary that I deserve. Oh yes, I can see that these guys are conniving. They want to do something against me, but my provision comes from the Lord. Okay, yes, I can see that there's darkness that wants to attack our marriage, but I'm declaring the promises of God. We are sound mind. We have the gift of sound mind. We have the gift of clarity, and no fear would reign on our life. When we know Jesus, we speak what Jesus says when we go through circumstance. That's the only way we can get the Jesus results. 
when we address situation as Jesus would address them. But most of the time, we run into our corners. We run into our corners of gossip to satisfy our own self, to speak what our friends want to hear, to speak what our parents want to hear. And it cannot produce results. It is what Jesus says. When he says, I am blessed, I am blessed. When he says, I have overcome, it means I am not trying to overcome. I have already overcome, overcame. That's what Jesus provides us with. But you need to know him. And today's message is not knowing him by listening to your preaching. It's knowing him by experiencing him. It's knowing him by having a revelation. Living this place with a conviction beyond reasonable doubt that you deserve good life. That you deserve to be listened to. That you deserve to be blessed. That you deserve not to be given any rejection. That that conviction is so strong that any authority, any director, any peers standing before you can never become so strong that he limits you to the level of lawlessness. It's a conviction that you deserve to have money. It's a conviction that you deserve to pass. It is a conviction that you deserve a good job. That while all the rest of the world is going through a bloom, you can declare, as for me and my family, we would not lack bread. The problem is we have reduced ourselves into an average person. We think like the world, behave like the world, and we feel like the situations of the world should affect us just like we affect the world. When we do so, there will be no change in our lives. Our knowledge of the Savior should make us better. Our communion with the Savior should make us better. And it should urge us to want more, to feel deserving more. Because indeed, we deserve more and better. Who else in the economy of our Father should have more other than us? Who else in the economy of our, of our Father should enjoy health and not us? But it is going to be your choice. Do you choose to believe what God is saying about you? When he says, you are healed. When he says, I am with you. When he says, you shall not drown even when you go through the water. Or you're going to choose to declare the language of the world. I'm drowning. I'm going. Ah, it's all bad. What are you going to say? Knowing Jesus should change how we speak. And how we believe. Just as you are seated there. I want you to whisper a prayer to Jesus. I want you to whisper a prayer to Jesus. Whisper a prayer to Jesus. Ask him to open you, the eyes of your heart. So that you can know him. Desire to go beyond head knowledge. About Jesus of Nazareth. To now having intimate relationship with him. Father we pray today in your presence. That we all end to know you more Jesus. To know you more than head knowledge. To know you beyond religion. But to experience your love, your hugs, your kisses. Your embrace. Lord Jesus to experience conversations with you. To experience the reality of your presence in our lives. Would you help those who have been here. Those who have been in the church. To move to a level of knowing you. Working with you. Talking with you. Getting your embrace. Getting your assurance. Knowing that you are with them. Despite what they go through. And those with struggle I pray. That Lord would you help them to know you are with them right where they are. And if they can lift up their voice, lift up their hearts of faith to you, you'd make a way. That's the new thing you're doing. In Jesus' name. Can we all stand? And we should stand in our feet. What an equation moment. If you are here this morning and you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you don't know Jesus as your Lord. This is the right time for you to call Jesus and say, Jesus, come into my heart. I want to be a new creation in you. That's what we are talking about. And if that's you this morning, I want you to flip up your hand. You want to give your life to Jesus. 
Make him your savior. Don't be shy. Just flip up your hand. I want to pray with you. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Uh, anyone else? Let's see. This is the time. This is the time. You don't know Jesus as your savior. What transforms you is getting into the kingdom. And this is an opportunity to get into the kingdom. Anyone who wants to give his life to Christ, maybe you are hesitating, maybe you are not sure. Maybe you have been coming to church. That's okay. But have you experienced him personally? As we see, can I ask you to come forward? Let's pray with you here. Just step here. 